Hello everybody. Uh, I thought we would do something a little different today and um, do the teaching live. Scary. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I want to um, discuss something today. You know, last week we talked about um, COVID-19 and the question, is this God's judgment? Um, for, a, you know, a, a world that has been turned upside down, for a world that's not following him. Uh, and I hope I showed you in last week's teaching that that is absolutely not true, that God placed all of his judgment on Jesus on the cross. So this COVID-19 is not God's judgment. God only has good things now for his children. So, but today I want to talk about another question that I've, um, I've heard asked, I've heard stated, and that is, one, is God trying to teach us something with this pandemic? And two, this is the most prevalent one I've heard, um, is this, hi Carolyn, in the UK, good to see you. Um, is this, um, lost my train of thought, is this God calling men to repentance? You know, because of the state of the world, is God, call, did God send this virus to draw men to himself, to call men to repentance? So those are the two questions that we're going to answer today. Is he trying to teach us something? And is God calling men to repentance through this virus? Did he send it? Was that the purpose for the virus? So we're going to start with the we're going to start with a question is this god calling men to repentance and you know jesus is our example for everything in the new testament and that's who we're going to look at today because it says in hebrews 1 3 that jesus is the express image of the father jesus himself says in john 5 john chapter 5 and john chapter 3 that he only does what he sees the father do and he only says uh what he hears the father say and this is why he could state in John 14 9 that if you've seen me you've seen the father so if we see Jesus if we see how Jesus responded to sin what his response is then we'll see what God's response is to the sin in the world today so did uh, well let's just start with the first example uh, go to John chapter 8 John chapter 8, and this is the account of the woman that was brought to Jesus that was caught in adultery. We have a lot of that in the world today, don't we? So let's see how Jesus responded, and we can know in kind that that is how God is looking at the sinners of today, okay? So John chapter 8, uh, start in, um, let's see, you know what, we're just going to kind of skim through instead of reading the whole thing because it's it's the whole account is in uh verses 1 through 11. Uh, verse 3 it says and the scribes and pharisees brought unto him unto jesus a woman who is taken in adultery and when they had set her in the midst they said that's fun hold on let's fix this okay there we go ah lesson learned okay uh verse 4 uh, the Pharisee said unto, unto Jesus, Master, this woman was taken in the very act of adultery. So she was caught in the act of adultery. My question would be is, where's the guy? Um, verse 5, now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say about that? What's your take on the sinner, Jesus? Um this they said, tempting him, this is verse six, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. I think this is a, a great example for everybody. When somebody asks you a question uh, that you don't know, don't just react, respond, speak immediately. Take a second. Allow the Holy Spirit to give you the words to say. It tells us in the New Testament that the Holy Spirit, it says, do not worry about what you'll say when, you brought, when you're brought before rulers, when you're brought before kings, because in that very hour, the Holy Spirit will give you the words to speak. So verse 7 um, 
So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone at her. And you'll see in the next few verses that everybody left after that. Because everybody knows that they've sinned. Everybody knows that according to the law, they deserved to be stoned themselves. So when Jesus said, He among you who hasn't sinned, let him throw the first stone. Well, they couldn't because they'd all sinned. We've all sinned, right? But how does Jesus view this woman? How does Jesus view the sinner? Go to verse 11. It says, um, she said, no man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. She sinned. Under the law, she should have been stoned. Under the New Testament, under the New Covenant, Jesus didn't recognize her sin. And he says, I am not condemning you. I am not judging you. Now, he does say, go and sin no more, because sin has consequences. Sin has earthly consequences. The consequences of our sin is not God's judgment, not God's condemnation. Jesus clearly says, I do not condemn you. This is the heart of the Father. Remember, he only says what God says. He only does what God does. He showed this sinner grace and mercy because that's what he was sent to do. He was sent to give life, not to take it. Okay, let's look at one more example. Uh, go to Luke chapter 9, and we're going to read verses 51 through 56. I'm a little nervous doing this live. That's weird. I don't know why. Anyway, I love you guys. Okay. Uh, okay. Nine verses 51 through 56. And it came to pass when the time was come that he, talking about Jesus, uh, should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face. And they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him. The Samaritans did not receive Jesus because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. He was a Jew. And when his disciples, James and John, when the believers saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elisha did? Isn't that kind of what a lot of believers are saying today? Yeah, God, send it on them. Take them out. Punish them. Condemn them. Judgment. They are, these, these people that are pro-abortion, that are pro-same-sex marriages, they are ruining this world. You need to send down. No. No, guys. This is, okay, so this is what the believers said to Jesus. And what did Jesus say to the believers? Okay. But he turned, I hope this isn't too harsh, guys. But he turned and rebuked them and said, You know not what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they moved on to the next village. Unlike in the Old Testament, when Elisha did call down fire from heaven as punishment, as judgment, that is not what God is doing today. That is not what Jesus came for. Jesus came so that when, when he looks, when God looks down on the sinner, he still loves them. He still loves them. I want to show you something. Um, why? How he can love the sinner. Go to Romans 5. Gunther's being so good in his crate. He's so cute. Maybe I'll show you later. Okay, Romans 5. Now let's start in verse 6. For when we were without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Who did Christ die for? He died for the weak and the ungodly. 
Look at verse 8. But God commendeth his love toward us. That just means God showed us his love when, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Look at verse 10. For if when we were enemies, I would say that a lot of the world is God's enemy today based on what they're propagating, what they're promoting, what they're, how they're, uh, you know, treating other people, what's going on in their lives. They are enemies. Everything that is opposed to the word of God is an enemy, right? But it says here, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. All enemies, all enemies of the gospel, even the ones that don't believe in Jesus right now, were reconciled, were brought back into favor with God. God is not holding man's sin against him because he placed it all on Jesus on the cross. And we saw that in the last teaching. So even the sinners are reconciled to God. Now, they haven't accepted Christ. They're still not going to heaven. They're still not going to spend eternity with him. They still don't have authority over the devil here on the earth. They aren't uh, available to in they aren't available to walk in all of the promises that God has for them, but they have been reconciled. The word says it right here. They have been reconciled to God. Jesus covered the sins of the entire world, 1 John 2, 2. Not just a few, not just the people who are born again. He covered the sins of the entire world, right? God's nature is love. 1 John 4, 8, and 16 says it emphatically. God is love. And we know that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That does not change. He loved the world so much that he sent his son to die for it. Why would he punish them now? Why would he punish the earth now when he loved us so much that he sent his only son, Jesus? Man, guys, I, I hope you're starting to see this. That our question is, is God calling us to repentance? Okay. Um, and we're we're getting there. Go to Luke. I'm I'm showing you how God is viewing sinners, okay? Go to Luke 6, um, verse 35. Okay, Luke 6:35. This says, love your enemies. God isn't do, telling us to do something that he isn't doing, right? Love your enemies and do good and lend hoping for nothing and your reward shall be great and you shall be children of the highest. Listen to this. For God is kind unto the unfaithful and to the evil one. God is kind even to that person that lives next door that has a completely different political view than you. Uh, even that person that lives next door that is steeped in sin and adultery and alcohol and all that other stuff. God is kind to the unfaithful and to the evil. John 10.10 10 says that uh, it is the enemy, it is the devil that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But God came so that we could have life and have it more abundantly. If it is, if it is something that is evil, if it is not something good, if it, this virus, has, this pandemic has come to steal, kill, and destroy, it is not from God. It is from the enemy. God would never use a tactic like that because sickness and disease and pandemics have already been paid for by Jesus. Turn over to James 1. James 1. And let's read verses 16 and 17, okay? Verse 16 says, Do not err. Uh, I think the King, the New King James says, do not be deceived, okay? We can be deceived. Eve was deceived, 
right? We can be deceived. Do not be deceived, my brethren. Every, do not be deceived, my brothers and sisters. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness or shadow of turning. This is a really simple uh, uh, summary of everything that I just shared with you, okay? God, good. Devil, evil. And if you forget, God, add an O and you get good. Devil, take away the D, take away the deception. You have evil. Okay, God good, <laughs> enemy evil. So how does God call men to repentance? If he's not using uh, sickness and disease, and let me ask you this question, guys. How do you think an unbeliever views that statement? God killed your child with this virus to bring you closer to him, to bring you to repent. How, how does that sound? That, that goes against the very, it hurts my heart, guys. That goes against the very nature of God, the very character of God, the very God that loves, right? Go to Romans 2, 4, and we are going to see definitively how God draws men to repentance, how God draws him to himself. Romans 4, 2, excuse me, Romans 2, 4, I didn't think that looked right. Romans 2, 4 says, or despise thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering." Listen to this, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. It is God's goodness that draws men. It's, it's when men hear the gospel and they realize that, oh my gosh, what I've been looking for all along, this love that I've been searching for, this unconditional love, this person that will accept me as I am, this person who will forgive me no matter what I've done, when people hear that message of the unconditional love and grace and goodness of God. That's what brings people to God, not pandemics, not viruses. God doesn't use something evil to draw men to him. You know, in our, in our logical minds, an unrenewed mind to God's word, that might make sense, you know, well, if you do this, then they're going to have to go to God. But that's not how God works. And I'm so glad we're not God. I am so glad that he sent his word so that we can know who he is, know what his plan is, know what his thoughts are. So that's how God brings men to repentance is through his goodness and through his goodness alone. So the second question, and this one's quite easy to, to answer uh, and quick to answer, I should say, is how does God teach us then? You know, we, we learn lessons through trials and tribulations and, and hard knocks and bad choices and mistakes. And, you know, but it wasn't God that brought the situation because everybody would be where they should be. Everybody would be perfect because we've all been through trials. We've all been through struggles. We've all faced sickness more than likely. Um, so how does God teach us? Okay, let's go to 2 Timothy 3.16. And I will show you without a doubt how God teaches us. Because this is how he says he teaches us. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, which means it's profitable to teach you. It's profitable for reproof, which means it's profitable to give you conviction of what is truth and what is not truth. 
uh, for correction, which means straightening you out when you do a piece of stupid, okay? Uh, and for instruction in righteousness. And that means to educate you are as to who you are as a believer in Christ. Verse 17, why? Why does he use this scripture? What does the scripture do for us? That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. It is through his word and through his word alone that he equips you to be who he has called you to be. It is through his word that he teaches you. Okay. Now, I, I know this is true. I have learned through trials and tribulations, but here's, here's the key. It was my choice to turn to God. It was my cho choice to turn to the word uh, to get through that trial, to get through the situation. And because of that, I've come out stronger on the other side. And the enemy still hasn't figured out that whatever he sends at me is going to make me stronger. So it's probably in his best interest to just for separate, uh, in, in separate reasons. So one of those couples uh, leaned on worldly counsel, worldly wisdom, and their marriage was destroyed, their lives were destroyed, and they never got over it. But another couple chose to lean on the word. They chose to see that it wasn't God that took their child, but it was the enemy. They placed their anger in the, in the right spot, and they leaned on God in that time for strength and understanding and wisdom. So it is not the trial that teaches you. It is your choice of turning to God's word and learning through that. So there's the answer to our two questions. And, and if, if I haven't explained this well, if you, if you have a question about what I've talked about, please put a question down in the comment section. I want to explain this so that nobody can misunderstand it. I don't want there to be a single person watching these videos share the videos with people. I don't want a single person watching to think that this is God's judgment, that this is God trying to teach us something, or if this is God warning men and calling them to repentance. It's just not his nature. It's not the covenant that we live under today. So guys, I, uh, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I pray uh, a level of protection and security over you and over your families. We speak to this coronavirus and we call it dead. We call it gone. We call it leaving and dissipating in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, that every person watching, they are covered by the mighty blood of Jesus and this virus will not come near their dwelling. No plague, no nothing can come against the children of the Most High God. And I pray, Lord, I pray, guys, that you grow in the wisdom and the revelation of the knowledge of him. And as you do that, man, things will change for you. Things will, things will just, they'll start lining up with the word that you know, right? And that's the whole goal is to become Christ-like, to experience what Christ experienced, to live the life that Christ lived. Hallelujah. Guys, thank you so much for joining me today. I, let me know if you enjoyed the live. I enjoyed the live, um, even though it was a little terrifying in the beginning. But um, I love you guys and uh, have a wonderful week. And um, I'll see you next time.